If you're anything like me and you want to get into real estate, the problem that you're running into is that you don't have the money yourself to do it. I was broke when I started. Now I've raised over $20 million, done hundreds and hundreds of deals. So in this video, I'm going to show you how you can use other people's money to fund all of your real estate deals and build generational wealth without having to use a single dime of your own money. So this room behind me is about to get full. Let's dive into the video. There's really two ways to get deals funded by other people. One is private money lending and one is hard money lending. Uh, I'll, I'll break down those two. Um, what it starts with, and I'm sure everybody's kind of heard this, is, uh, is the bird. Anybody in the room heard that before? Very normal phrase, cool. So the first two things are really the two things we're gonna focus on is buying and rehabbing, right? You can't buy the house without money and you can't rehab the house without money, right? It's kind of hard to do that. So the two differences of getting deals funded from other people's money is private money and hard money. And I wanna make sure there's a difference between the two so you understand it. Hard money lending, both of them are great. I've used both of them in my career. Hard money lending is an institution that lends you money. You're dealing with like a sales rep, you got an underwriter, you got a loan originator, you got to submit an application, you got to upload your, uh, your uh, uh, tax returns. You got to do all these things to get approved for hard money. And they put most, most uh, hard money lenders have to do an appraisal on the property, which again, takes a little bit more time, right? So hard money's great. They're never going to fund 100% of your deal. Usually they'll fund 80 to 90% of the deal. And then you still have to come up with the other 10 to 20%, which is a problem if you don't have money. I've been there before, right? So you could raise private money for the gap, quote unquote, which is that 10 to 20%. The problem with hard money is you still have to make monthly interest payments. So if you borrow 200 grand at 10%, that's 20,000, that's like $1,800 a month or whatever it is, right? So you gotta pay 1,800 a month to that hard money lender. Get a few of those going, you're paying 10 grand a month, 20 grand a month in interest payments. That can, that can screw up a business, right? Anybody know why businesses go bankrupt? There's only one reason, and one reason only. It's lack of cash flow. That's the only reason people go bankrupt. So you wanna keep your cash flow as tight as possible. So again, hard money lenders are great. They serve an amazing purpose. I've used them before. But the goal is to use private money lenders. Get deals 100% funded, 100%, get all the money the day you close. You don't have to escrow funds and rehab. You don't have to front that money to get draws to continue the rehab. You can get all the money day one and get 100% funded. And literally the money that I raised, I shoot this morning, I was on a, we got a refi closing uh, tomorrow. It's a $5 million refi. And then I have eight other units um, that we bought like two months ago. I brought a lender in on that. He needs his money back. Uh, so we're refining that next Friday. I texted my lender that we're paying off tomorrow, texted, and I was like, it was an email. I was like, yo, we're paying this off. I got another deal you can roll 600 grand of your 650 into, are you in? The response, yes, send me the wire. Come on now. Like there's no uh, uh, application, there's no appraisal, pro he doesn't even know the addresses, real, like real talk. He has no idea what the addresses are. <laughs> and he's wiring 600 grand on next Wednesday from an email, right? So when you build these relationships, it's, it's literally, anybody raise money from a text message before? I know some guys in here, 100%. Once you build these relationships, they're personal relationships, and they will fund money you know, whenever, for whatever. Uh, don't put them in a bad situation, right? You know, don't buy something stupid, because then it, the, it, it still comes back on you, right? Like you're still hooked on, you're still liable for that money, uh, but it's, it's the best type of money you can get access to. So just want to deviate the difference between hard money and private money. Both of them serve a purpose. The goal is to get private money and get it uh, funded 100% uh, from day one. Everybody with me? That makes sense? Cool. <clears throat> so the next thing is like, all right, cool. This sounds great, Austin. You know, private money's cool. Getting houses for free, quote unquote, sounds great. But where do I find these people at? You know, like where are private money lenders at? And to be honest with you, <laughs> it's, uh, they're, they're literally everywhere. And I know that sounds cliche, but they are. I've raised more money. I've raised over $20 million in my career over the last seven, seven and a half years. I've raised more money in rooms like this than anything else out there. Probably more than half the money I've raised has been in rooms like this. So actually talk, because the thing is when you talk with people that are in real estate or real estate rooms, they have an idea of real estate. They've, they've heard the terminology of private money lending before at some point most likely, versus going to like your doctor. Like, hey man, you want to give me money? Well, why would I give you money? Like my money's in the stock market, right? Uh, but it's very easy to have the conversation to people like this because they already understand it. You're not trying to convince them to lend in real estate. You're just trying to get, convince them to lend to you because they already know that that's an option. 
If you're going out, you know, meeting people at bars, in country clubs, in car shows, uh, and anywhere else that money is at, that's a little bit harder of a conversation, but I've raised money from there as well, right? Money comes from anywhere, and especially in today's market, if you can't raise money today, we got way bigger problems out there because everything is going to crap. Stocks crashed, crypto crashed. I don't even pay attention to the stocks, I pay attention to crypto, but uh, everybody's losing everything, right? My dentist, for the first time in seven years, I've been telling him about this for seven years, he's like, all right, I'm in, right? My pops went to the dentist uh, a couple months ago, and I've been, I've been hard selling them, my dad's been talking about it, and uh, went into the dentist, my dad did. The guy was like, hey, how you doing? That walked in, he's like, man, I'm feeling great. He said, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be really bad though if my money was in the stock market because it's down 30% right now. Me, I got all my money, I'm earning 10, 12% interest, I ain't lost a penny, and I'm still getting paid. And my dentist was like, man, I wanna hear a little bit more about this now. Send, send me an email, sent him a, a private lending packet, told him what it was, hopped on the phone, he was like, all right. He actually came to a project. He's like, all right, I'm in. Let me know your next deal. 200 grand, he said he's ready to rock. So you never know where money's gonna come from. You just have to talk to people continuously nonstop. And it sounds crazy, but like I literally talk to every single person I meet about money. Like my goal is to get money. Cause you gotta understand, you are doing, listen to this and write this down and truly, truly believe this. You are doing somebody a disservice by not telling them about the opportunity of lending you money. You're doing them a disservice. I've had people call me literally crying, thanking me for allowing them to retire or crying, thanking me for allowing them to retire in a better position than what they were. Like I got goosebumps just talking about this. You are truly, truly, truly doing somebody a disservice by not allowing them to invest with you, right? So when you're having these conversations, it's not a conversation of like, hey man, can, can you please, you know, give me some money? Can you please let me borrow some money? That's what I did on my first deal. Like it was a quarter million dollars and like negotiation, I'm down here. I'm like, hey, like, you know, can you help me out? Can you give me some money? And, you know, she dictated the terms. She did whatever she wanted to do because I wasn't confident in myself. But when I truly understand the power of it, I can talk to anybody about money. I'm standing here talking about money. Like, you gotta understand the power that you have with it. And everything I'm gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk about the terms and the process and the documents and all that stuff. So when you go out to talk to people, you're actually gonna have the confidence to share this opportunity with them. And when, you, when you're asking people for money, you don't say, you know, can you lend me money? You say, I have an opportunity, are you interested? It's an entirely way, it's an entirely different way of having a conversation. And the conversation will go so, so much farther uh, by doing that, right? So access to money. Most people think they only uh, can lend with cash in a bank account. Most people don't have cash just sitting in a bank account, right? If you need 200 grand, most people just don't have 200 grand sitting in their you know, checking account. So that's one way that you can get access to, and if they have that, that's great. It's very simple, they write a check, you're done, right? There's a lot of other ways that people don't know about. Right, does anybody know that people can lend you money out of their self-directed retirement account? Does anybody even know what that is? Cool, couple people. Me too, a few years ago. So basically what happens is business owners pay, anybody can put money into an IRA or 401k, and most of the time that money's invested into stocks. So somebody manages the money, it goes into stocks. You need to educate people about this, by the way. That's the only way that they're gonna to lend to you. So what they can do is they can roll their money from an IRA, traditional IRA, to a self-directed IRA, Google IRA custodians. There are a bunch of them out there, specialized IRAs who I've used. Um, and basically what happens is they roll their IRA to a self-directed IRA. It takes like you know 14 to 30 days, two to four weeks for that to happen. All their money rolls over and then they can dictate, self-directed, they can self-direct that investment. So guess what? That investment comes to me. They're lending me money. So I teach people how to do this. I'm like, yo, I got a deal for 200. They're like, perfect, here's 200 grand. That's how more than 50% of the money that I've raised has came from, self-directed IRAs. And if you're not talking about this to people, you're definitely not gonna get the money. So when you're talking, hey, if somebody becomes interested in lending you money, right? Sit down, you have a conversation, hey man, you know, where's your money currently invested at right now? Well, you know, got an IRA, you know, got a few hundred grand in there. Um, and that's really about it. Cool. Now you know that's something that you have to have a conversation about. What are you earning on that? Right now, is your stocks down? Yes, they're down 20, 30%. How would you feel if I could give you 10% 
and not lose money. Sounds great, right? Last year or two, you know, people making 20, 30, 40% in stocks, kind of hard to compare with that, to beat that, right? But now, now's the time to raise money because everything's down. So self-directed IRA is one way. Um, another example that I have, I was talking with a gentleman, similar conversation to what I had. You know, he's like, no, I don't have an IRA. It's like, do you own a house? He's like, yeah, I own a house. Perfect. How much do you owe on the house? Zero. Awesome. How much is the house worth? 400 grand. Cool. If I could show you how you can pull out $300,000 out of that house, a, a, a line of credit, 300 grand out of the house, pay 5% interest, and then I can pay you 12% interest so you can make money on money that's not even yours in the first place. Would that be something that you're interested in? Uh, yeah. Who wants to make free money? I think, I think everybody in the room wants a little bit more money for free. So uh, home equity lines of credit, they can borrow from that. Cash value life insurance policies. And these are questions you have to ask people because they don't understand that they can tap into money this way. So if someone's been paying into their life insurance policy for 10 years, and guess what? They have, might have 100 grand of cash value at that point. So they can pull that money out, pay 5% interest or whatever the number is, and you can pay 8, 10, 12, 14%, whatever you wanna pay. So again, they're getting access to money that's not even theirs in the first place, right? So you have to have these conversations with people to teach them how they can access money. And if you teach them that, they're gonna trust you, and then they're probably gonna lend you the money instead of some random walking down the street. Is that fair? We good with that? So that's how to access uh, the money. Uh, one last thing, I, I wanna talk about this. I'll go back to you know, giving somebody an opportunity of a lifetime. Do you know most people's like plan for, first off, most people don't even have money for a retirement. If they do have money, most people's plan for retirement is to save, you know, over their 60 years of working, whatever it is, save, let's say a million bucks, and then they retire at 65, retire, and basically their plan is like, hey, if I can make like 3% a year on this money and take out, you know, 80 grand a year to spend for my life, to live and enjoy life, the last 20 years of your life, by 85, you know, I'll have no money left. So at 85, you know, I'm gonna be dead, right? And I'm gonna be out of money. Perfect, if that works out for you. What if you live till you're 90? That's why you see people in Walmart, old people, in Walmart, in McDonald's, and Burger King, and stuff like that. That's how people's plan for retirement is. So think about this. Investing with us, somebody's got a million bucks, right? They lend you the money. Call, say they make 10% a year, you paying them. You can pay them 100 grand a year in interest and never touch the principal. So now that person can live until they're 100 and get 100 grand a year, which is more money than they would have got, you know, drawn out of that money. And guess what? When they die, they can give their kids a million bucks instead of zero. You get where I'm coming from? Like, you have to talk to people to give them an opportunity to invest with you. If you do not talk, you are doing these people a disservice. And that, that's the biggest mindset shift that you have to change. You're not asking, you're giving somebody an opportunity of a lifetime. So documents, once somebody does get uh, interested in lending you money, you know, are there contracts? You know, what, what happens once somebody says like, yeah, I'm in. So you basically get a deal and I always make the comparison to a bank. So you got a bank and then you got a private money lender. They basically play the same role. It's just a private money lender instead of a bank, right? So I'm like, hey, you know, if you own a house? Yes, I own a house. Cool. If you stop paying your mortgage, what would happen? Well, I'd go into foreclosure and the bank would take the house back. Awesome. So you're going to do the same exact thing. You're going to get a promissory note from me promising to pay you back, you know, 200 grand at 10% interest 12 months from now, whatever the terms are, and you get a mortgage on the property. So if I stop, if I don't pay what I agree to, you do, you foreclose on the property and you take the asset back. What are the tallest buildings in downtown most of the time? Banks. Their model works. You feel me? They make money, it's not rocket science. So if somebody can take the position of a bank, that's probably a pretty good position to be in. So that's why I always make that comparison. So they get a note, promissory note from you, they get a mortgage from you, first, second, third mortgage, depending on how many lenders you bring on. Um, life insurance policy, not life insurance, title insurance policy, um, in case something you know, goes away with, uh, with the title. Um, and then a builder's risk policy. Make sure you write that down as well. Builder's risk, not traditional insurance. Uh, if you're doing any sort of heavy rehab, you know, plumbing, electric, HVAC, framing, anything like that, uh, and, and the house burns down or whatever happens, insurance company is gonna go in and they're probably not gonna pay you because you don't have a builder's risk policy. So builder's risk is like heavy construction. Uh, regular traditional rental pro uh, insurance is like, you know, paint and carpet, right? If you're doing paint and carpet, 
I mean, you should always get a builder's risk, but you can do that on, uh, you can take that risk on your own. But highly, highly, highly recommend uh, the builder's risk policy. And then if, so my first lender, it was a $74,000 purchase, $170,000 rehab. So if I bought the deal, took $244,000 and then fled the country, she would have lent 244 grand on a $74,000 house. Some lenders that are educated don't want to do that. They don't want to give you all the money up front, right? So there's an option to that as well. And when you're having conversations, they might ask you these questions. Uh, so basically you can escrow that, those rehab funds and then draw on those as, a, as the project continues. So with that, you'll need like an escrow agreement, a rehab agreement, a lien release, a um, couple other documents. But I wouldn't even bring that up unless they ask for it. Because like, you don't want to like make your life harder. Don't even bring it up unless they ask for it. Uh, but those are the documents that you're going to use uh, when you're talking and working with uh, private money lenders. And then, you know, all right, cool. Somebody's interested. Do they lend me the money? Like, do they wire the money to my bank account? No. Don't take the money, like, it, unless you're like very versed in like the SEC and all that stuff. Um, it's probably not a good idea. So basically, what happens is you get a deal for 100 grand, 100k rehab, so 200,000. Uh, you send it to the title company. The title company's like, yo, we're ready to close. You get a lender for 200 grand. At closing, the lender wires the 200 grand to the title company, not you, to the title company. At closing, you're going to sign the promissory note, you're going to sign the mortgage, you're going to sign all the other closing documents, and then 100 grand of the 200 is going to go to the seller. The other 100 would go to you to fund the rehab unless you're escrowing some of those funds. So you really never touch that money. And then when you go to sell the property, same thing. You copy the title company, you talk, copy the lender in on an email. Like, hey, six months later, we're selling this. 200 grand loan, 10%, 20,000 a year. You used it for six months. You're paying $10,000 in interest. Copied on this email is my lender. We're selling this on Friday. Uh, the interest is 10 grand. Here's how I calculated it. Uh, the payoff's $210,000. Lender, please send in your wire info. And then at closing, your buyer buys the deal and then the title company pays off your lender and then you get whatever's money's left. Is that cool? Sim super simple process on how uh, money flows through the title company. Um, and then terms, so this is a big one, right? What type of like terms are you gonna be working with uh, with a title company, I mean with a private money lender? What's good, what's bad? Um, and this is like a very vague, you know, guideline, right? Because uh, everybody's different. That's the cool thing with private money. It's 100% negotiable. You can literally come up with whatever you want to come up with. As long as the other person agrees with that, that is the only thing that matters. So like if somebody, if I'm talking with somebody, they're like, hey, all my money's in a CD earning 0.01%. And I'm like, bet, I'll pay you 12%. That's like a 12,000 X higher return. Immediately, they're gonna be like, oh no, like that's a scam. Like 12%, that's, that's crazy. I made this mistake when I started. I was so happy to talk to people. I'm like, yo, I'll pay you 10%. 12%, you want 14? Bet, 14%. The problem is, is like everybody thought I was a scam artist because like these returns are crazy in real life. Like making 20, 30, 40% on your money in stocks and the you know real estate market going crazy is not normal. It's only been normal for the last like one to three years, right? So if somebody can earn a double digit return, most people think that that's a scam. So don't just lead with that. Ask people where their money's invested and what type of the returns they're currently seeing right now. So I never lead with interest. You know, if anybody specifically asks that question, okay, you know, I'm, give or take, you might be able to earn double digit returns, maybe, right? There's a couple of variables to that. And then when I'm asking them the questions about where their money's at, how they have access, what type of returns they're seeing, let's say they say, you know, 6%. Okay, awesome. You know, if I could show you how to take that money and invest it into an asset that's backed by an asset that doesn't depreciate 30% overnight, unlike stocks and crypto, what would make sense for you? How much interest would you need to make? They might say 7%, right? They might say 10%, they might say 12%. So don't just run up and lead with that number. Let them tell you how much money they want. Uh, but for me, I'm happy to pay 8% is great, 10% is good, 12%, I'm like, yeah, we're getting high. 14, 16%, I'm like, yeah, okay, this is really high. Uh, so eight to like 12-ish, you know, is a decent range. Uh, but you gotta understand, it's never the cost of the money that's important, it's the availability of the money that really matters. So let me say that again, it's never the cost that is important, it's the availability that matters. So if you got your first deal, you know, you've been wholesaling a lot, you're trying to get in the game, whatever it is, and somebody's like, yo, like, forget 10%, I want 50% equity. Give them 50% equity, if you can't raise the money elsewhere. Because what happens is, the second you do a deal, your confidence goes through the roof, your credibility goes through the roof, 
you believe that you're actually giving somebody an opportunity, so these private money conversations are a hell of a lot easier, and then you'll be able to raise money on your own terms, right? So if you gotta pay, you know, 16% to make 45 grand in profit instead of 50 grand in profit, do the deal, right? Get the credibility, make the money, and then go out and raise the money that you wanna uh, raise on the terms that you like. So eight, eight to 12%, um, you know, is, is pretty good in my eyes. Uh, and then points. Again, never mention points. Most lenders have no idea what points even are. A point is 1% of the loan. So if, you know, if you're borrowing 200 grand, one point is a $2,000 fee. So it might, somebody might lend a 10% and one point, right? Never mention this, because nobody even knows what uh, points are. If they do ask, one, two points, you know, it's kind of okay, uh, pretty, pretty regular. Uh, if you're paying like six points or eight points, like that's getting kind of reckless. Uh, but again, if it's your only option and you gotta make 40 instead of 50, go make the 40 grand, get the credibility, right? Um, the third thing, uh, I never, I've only one time in my life ever paid monthly interest payments. It's not even something I bring up. Again, if you ask somebody like, hey, do you want monthly interest payments or do you wanna wait for a year and hope that I pay you back? Which one do you think they're gonna say? They're gonna want monthly interest payments, right? I would, right? So don't even bring it up. Like, hey, it's for a year, pay you back. If I pay you back in six months, you know, you'll get the interest in. They don't even know what the other option is. So don't even bring it up, right? Um, what other terms are there? I think that's it, so like eight to 12%, you know, zero, ideally, it's like two-ish points, um, no monthly interest payments. Uh, our notes are written for a year, so if, you, if it's like a way bigger deal, write it for like two or three years or something, which means that you have to pay the back money back before that time. Uh, there's no prepayment penalty, so I can pay it off at any time. The interest is prorated, so if I borrow 200 grand at 10%, it's 20 grand in interest. If I use it for six months, it's six grand in interest. No, 10 grand in interest, <laughs> my bad. Uh, if I use it for three months, it's five grand in interest. So it's prorated to the time. Um, and they, there's no, uh, they can pull their money out at any time. You know, give me a 30 day notice, I'll cash you out, I'll bring another lender in, um, and I'll pay you your interest, and everybody will be happy and move on. So those are the terms that, you know, I've kind of came, uh, you know, normal to use. But again, you can borrow on whatever terms you agree. I know people that borrow 4%, right? I haven't found a lender that wants 4% interest personally. If you can find a lender that wants 4%, 100% go out there and do that. Like, why would you pay more money than you have to, right? But again, that goes back to asking them what they're comfortable with versus you just leading with 12%. Because once you give somebody 15%, 12%, it's almost impossible to go backwards. You do two deals, 15%, cool. The third deal, you're like, hey, lender, like, I got this deal, bet, I'm in. Can I pay you 10% instead of 15%? Why would they do that? You're cutting their pay by 33%. Nobody wants their pay cut. So it's very difficult to go backwards, but if it's your only option, do it and then go raise more money uh, elsewhere. And like I said, you gotta talk to everybody. There's gonna be, a, just like sellers, just like buying houses, you gonna get a thousand no's hung up on, cussed out, door slammed in your face, and then sooner or later, somebody's gonna say yeah, right? Uh, so the big thing, the biggest thing I wanna stress out here, make sure you're talking to people about IRAs. There's so much money in IRAs. A buddy of mine uh, last week, he runs one of the biggest IRA companies in there. Um, I forget, the number was something stupid. He was like, there's $5 trillion in IRAs that are not invested. Not invested. I was like, $5 trillion, what? This is crazy. People just don't know what they don't know. You know what I mean? So you have to be the one to go out there and educate them on how they can get access uh, to more money or how you can get access to more money uh, through their retirement accounts. So you gotta teach them about retirement accounts. That's a wrap. So if you wanna see in person me walking through a perfect bird deal, make sure you check out this video here. Appreciate you being here.